war in the Persian Gulf began with the roar of F-14 Tomcats, A-6E intruders, and stealth bombers as they streaked into the black skies over Saudi Arabia. The sheer display of technology arrayed by the alliance against Iraq's Saddam Hussein was mind-boggling. The world watched as television screens replayed the spectacle of smart bombs zoning in on their targets. We heard of Royal Weasel aircraft, which could in effect turn off an entire nation's radar system. The thunder of air power left us almost breathless those first few days. A man who would have Kuwait had to watch as his military machine was systematically put out of commission. Operation Desert Storm proceeded more effectively than almost anyone could have imagined. But then, of course, we began to see that there was a cost in the liberation of Kuwait. This was more than just a sophisticated video game. Real human beings were dying. And when the ground assaults kicked off, we began to see the inevitably gruesome face of war. Those flag-draped coffins coming home made us pause to reflect on life and death and how to comfort grieving family. It is written. This is George Vanderman presenting as the answer to your deepest needs, the living Christ. Today, from foxhole to eternity. After the glory of successful military action, there's always the grief. After the ground gain and the goals achieved, there's always the cost. The Gulf War made many of us face very hard questions. We had to ask when and if war is justifiable. We had to ponder the problem of civilian casualties. And above all, we had to face the tragedy of men and women cut down in the prime of life. What about them? Was their existence at an end? Were all their dreams irrevocably snuffed out just like that, with the thud of a, a rifle bullet or mortar shell? And what could we say to the families folding up their flags after that son or husband or sister had been put into the ground. Do we have any word of comfort for them? Of course, it isn't just the casualties who raise these questions for us. Every soldier out on the battlefield has to come to terms with death. Up close, personal. Bullets whizzing overhead have a way of making life's basic issues stand out clear and sharp. And today I want to give you Bible answers to your questions about death and the afterlife. We can make up all kinds of answers ourselves, of course. We can imagine everything from spirits floating around to a city at the end of the yellow brick road. But it's time we take a careful look at what the Bible has to say. We need answers we can count on. No other book in the world gives so much evidence of being inspired and an authoritative message from our Creator. And Scripture has a great deal to say about the nature of man and our destiny. It speaks quite clearly on the subject. The first principle which the Bible presents may not seem that encouraging at first glance. It is, in fact, grimly realistic. In Genesis 3, we discover certain facts of life which God revealed to Adam and Eve shortly after sin and death entered the scene. The third chapter and the 19th verse, God said, By the sweat of your brow you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you will return. Now, this is the origin of that phrase, dust to dust. Remember? Scripture faces hum human mortality squarely. It doesn't try to imagine death away. Elsewhere in the Bible, man is described as a breath that passes away and does not come again, or a flower that fades away. Yes, even in the New Testament, we find this acceptance of the fleeting nature of human existence. James wrote this to the 
uh, some of his arrogant contemporaries. James, the fourth chapter and the 14th verse. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a while and then vanishes. A mist that vanishes? Interesting enough, nowhere in the Bible do we find lofty passages about man's immortal soul or eternal spirit. Those phrases simply never occur. Most people have come to associate ideas about innate immortality of the soul with Christianity, and believers have been attempting to encourage others with such thoughts for some time. But Scripture makes it very clear that because of sin, man is definitely, without exception, mortal. So does this, does this mean that there are no grounds for hope beyond the grave? Is our eternal destiny in the dust? Oh, friend, the Bible, as a matter of fact, fairly bursts with hope, as we shall see. But it points that hope in only one direction. Listen to this bit of enthusiastic praise from Paul's first letter to Timothy, 6th chapter, verses 15 and 16. God, the blessed and only ruler, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone is immortal and who lives in unapproachable light. Notice the phrase, who alone is immortal. This is the starting point for hope in the Bible. God alone is immortal. That's the first answer we must look at. When we're struggling to come to terms with death, with those flag draped coffins, we must look for hope in God alone. That sounds so simple, so straightforward, that yet many people are missing that point today. We try to find grounds for hope in something inside us. We try to detect some spark of immortality, some essence that will remain unchanged after our flesh, flesh decays. Some people even try to capture a hint of the past life and pin their hopes on reincarnation. But the Bible is clear, my friend. God alone is immortal. Our hope is in Him or it's nowhere. Finding a way beyond the grave depends on something in God, not something in us. It depends on something God does, not something we do. We prepared a book which explains in so much more detail what the Bible says about what happens to us after death. It's called In Search of a Soul. I think you'll be especially intrigued by the material contained in the chapters Disguising the End, Heaven's Borderline, and more. I don't want you to miss this bi vital biblical information, so please call or write for your free copy. We'll have more information at the close of our program. Immortality depends on God alone. Now, admittedly, that fact may seem a rather formidable problem in itself to many people. After all, the God who alone is eternal is also described as dwelling in unapproachable light. Immortality can seem a very long way off when it's hidden in the Almighty. Well, here's where the Bible's second great principle about immortality comes into play. Let's look at it. 1 John 5, 11 and 12, the beloved apostle proclaims loud and clear, God has given us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. This immortality dwelling in unapproachable light has come down to earth. Eternal life has come to us in the person of Jesus Christ. It's as if the infinite riches of heaven were condensed into one bright passage, package, and that package is Christ, the Son of God. Immortality is the gift He brings to us from our Father. Now, the Apostle John makes it very plain. If you have the Son, you have eternal life. If you don't, you don't. Jesus Christ, by His sacrifice on the cross, opened the way for sinful human beings to actually possess immortality. This mortality which sin brought on us can be canceled. Those who accept the Son as Lord and Savior can share in the very life of God. The Bible makes immortality a matter of a relationship. It's a personal thing between you and Christ. By accepting Him, we're welcomed into eternal life. 
That's what people need today, a personal individual answer. Those men and women who huddled in trenches in the desert, listening to artillery shells whine overhead, are each one a heart beating, a story, a face looking wearily into the threat of death. They feel that they've had an individual rendezvous with destiny. One army recruit headed for the Persian Gulf put it this way, If there's a bullet out there with my name on it, that's okay. It's my time. It's the ones that say to whom it may concern that worry me. Nobody wants to be just a statistic. No one sees themselves as part of a mass of casualties. And certainly the families waiting back home don't see their loved ones that way. We each want to to count as a person. We don't want our lives to just trickle away into a sea of past humanity. That's why the answer which Christ offers is such good news, my friend. When Jesus came down to earth, it was God's way of saying, you count. Yes, you individually. I want to meet you. I want to begin a relationship with you. I want you to accept me so that we can enjoy eternal life together. God went to great lengths to give us assurances about just how we can hope for life beyond the grave. Listen for a moment to the Savior He said in John, the fifth chapter, verse 24, I tell you the truth, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be condemned. He has crossed over from death to life. Believers have crossed from death to life. They're no longer condemned because Christ is forgiven. They're no longer doomed mortals because eternal life is in the Son and they have the Son. Of course, the value of such a promise depends upon the one making it. Well, who is this individual making these promises about eternal life? Listen to what the Apostle Paul has to say about the Son of God. That marvelous book, Colossians, first chapter, 16th verse, he speaks of Christ as the image of the invisible God. And then he says, by him, all things were created things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Jesus Christ is creator. That's the one giving us these assurances about eternal life. He fashioned the multitude of creatures that fill the earth. He's the one who formed Adam out of the dust of the ground. And friends, he's the one who will form us again from the dust of death. He can do it. He has the power. Men and women facing the horrors of war need to know that. People staring up at the black sky, knowing that any minute a Scud missile could hurtle down and obliterate them, they need to know that. Many of those flag draped coffins which come home are sealed. The sad fact is the unrecoverable remains are one of the legacies of war. How hard it is for the grieving mother or brother or wife to cling to hope if they're looking for something in the loved one. It's hard to imagine ever seeing that person again when physically he or she has all but disappeared from the face of the earth. But our hope is in Jesus Christ, the creator, the recreator. He can create living, breathing, thinking, feeling human beings out of the dust of the ground. In other words, out of nothing. That's the secret of immortality. Don't try to look for it in some unconquerable soul. Don't try to listen for it in the whispering of some spirit within. Immortality is in Jesus, period. If you have the Son, you have eternal life. This brings us to our final question. Just what kind of afterlife are we talking about here? What will it be like beyond the grave? Interesting enough, The more people try to zero in on immortality within human beings, the more vague the picture of the afterlife becomes. Perhaps you've noticed that. Some place they're hoping out of body experiences. People report feeling that they're somehow having their bodies, leaving their bodies and floating through a dark tunnel towards some spot of light. Others believe that after death, their spirits are still somehow able to communicate with their loved ones. All this is very understandable effort to imagine something remaining after those bodies of ours return to dust. We instinctively believe that we're more than just a collection of chemical substances. And you're right. 
when God breathed into Adam the breath of life, he became a conscious being. Where we go astray is in trying to believe that immortality is something generated from within. A do-it-yourself afterlife leaves most of us pretty cold. It's quite vague and abstract. And you know, that's the kind of picture that most young men and women fighting in a war are interested in. They're in their prime. They're very much physically alive. Who wants to be some kind of spirit floating about? Who wants to come back as an abstraction in the cosmos? These ideas don't suggest life after death as much as death after death. But Scripture does offer us a very definite, fleshed-out picture of eternal life in heaven with God and our loved ones. It offers us a real place for real life with real relationships. And it starts at a definite point in time. Listen, friend, the second coming of Jesus Christ. Now, does the picture fit together? Paul describes what happens in 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, verses 51 to 53. We shall not all sleep, that is, die. We shall not all sleep, but we'll all be changed in a flesh, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. Scripture doesn't say that we float away into the clouds. No, it says we're resurrected. Christ recreates us and we're clothed with immortality. That's when the gift of eternal life becomes a physical reality. From the dust of the grave, we come forth, forth living, thinking, feeling, whole human beings. And this is not an out-of-the-body experience. This is an ultimate in-the-body experience. Paul describes it in the same chapter, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 42 to 44, again, the resurrection chapters. The body that is sown is perishable. It is raised imperishable. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. Christ the Creator will give us wonderful new bodies at His coming, bodies infinitely better than our old ones, bodies that, Paul says, bear the likeness of the man from heaven. This is the hope that God's Word offers each one of us. And this is the hope which our dangerous world desperately needs. Young men and women cut down in the prime of life can know there's a resurrection, a resurrection to real physical life. The casualties of war and their families can be assured that there's a heaven, a heaven of real personal reunions. Listen, a story comes to us from another war hundreds of years ago a time when the armies of Napoleon were sweeping over Europe. One of Napoleon's generals made a surprise attack on the small town of Feldkirk, located on the Austrian border. The people there could look out their windows and see a vast assembly of disciplined French troops maneuvering into place on the heights above their town. A council of citizens was hastily summoned and began nervously debating whether to surrender immediately or attempt some sort of defense. The situation looked bleak indeed, but then an old church pastor stood up in the council and declared, this is Easter day. We've been counting on our own strength, and that will fall. That will fail us. This is the day of the Lord's resurrection. Let us ring the bells and have services as usual, and leave the matter in God's hands. We know only our weakness and not the power of God. Well, that little speech produced quite an effect on those leaders of Felkak. They decided to accept the plaster's plan. In a few moments, everyone heard the bells in the church belfry ring out loud and clear the joyous announcement of the Savior's resurrection. And that sound echoed up to the French troops, positioning their cannon, fixing their bayonets, the officers there concluded that this sudden ringing meant that the Austrian army had arrived during the night. So they quickly broke camp and rode back toward France. The danger was lifted before the Easter bell stopped ringing. Friends, there's no news in the world like the news of Christ's resurrection. 
Only that event can give people hope even amid the horrors of war. Only that event offers us the chance of real life, eternal life beyond the grave. Oh, whatever dangers you're facing now, whatever grief you're enduring, listen for those Easter bells. Christ is extending the ultimate gift to all who accept him. He wants to begin a relationship that will last forever. And Marilyn Cotton, this time at the piano, with that heartwarming, hopeful song of the resurrection, we shall behold him. The sky shall unfold, preparing The sweet light in his eyes shall, shall enhance those awaiting, and we Thank you, Marilyn. Now shall we pray together. Father mine, we thank you 
for the gift of immortality in Jesus Christ. We find little reason for hope by looking within ourselves. We now want to place our faith entirely in you and your victory over sin and death. Thank you for dying for us and resurrecting for us. Thank you for opening the way to a wonderful heaven where we can enjoy life at its fullest with you. Keep us safe in your everlasting arms and keep us looking up for the coming Savior. In his name we ask it. Amen. Our gift book for you today explores in full detail this fascinating topic, life after death. In search of a soul, what really happens when a person dies? Does he or she live again? If so, when? After reading this book, you won't have to wonder anymore. You'll know exactly what the Bible teaches about death and the promise of eternal life. Remember, that's in a search for the soul. Yours free without any obligation whatsoever. Now, here is the information you need. As a convenience, you may request the free gift offer by calling our toll-free number, 1-800-253-3000. Call right now. That's 1-800-253-3000. Remember, the offer is sent by mail, free and postpaid. You may have to dial the number more than once, but please keep trying. The operator needs only your name, address, and phone number, and the name of the offer you want. Call toll-free now, 1-800-253-3000. Lines are open now. That's 1-800-253-3000. If you prefer, you may request the offer by writing to George Vandeman, Thousand Oaks, California, 91360. Our time is now past. But remember, it is written... Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Mm -hmm.